Lines, that's a good. What is up, everybody? I'm back again for another stream. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about all the interesting ways to improve being a game designer in particular. Uh, I've had a couple of questions on the Discord talking about uh, what can I do to improve? Uh, what's the next step? What should I study? How should I approach this uh, sort of independent, independently motivated sort of journey of being a game designer? Because a lot of us do things on our own. Um, the game design educational track is relatively new. Uh, people there's a lot of tools out there for making your own games or editing your own levels and all that. So a lot of people I feel like have a little bit of experience with game design, but a lot of people also do not have a really clear idea of the things that you can do to improve your skills as a designer and the pitfalls to avoid. So I'm just making this video uh, to give you guys some practical tips on how to improve your design skills and uh, some gut check questions and some really clear takeaways on how you can sort of measure up your scales and figure out what area you should be spending uh, the most energy on. So, conveniently enough, uh, Tanya Short created a Twitter uh, thread about how to improve as a game designer. And a lot of the things in this thread are exact same things I've been telling people for years. So I'm just gonna go through her list and we'll just talk about each individual element and then we're gonna just kind of spiral off into some other stuff. Uh, so real quick, here is the thread. Boop. As requested, here is a little thread with thoughts and observations on how to grow as a game designer from aspiring to senior. As a salaried game designer for over 10 years, it's okay if you disagree with me, star. You know, gotta always put stuff like this when you're on Twitter because Twitter is generally on fire. Um, number one, starting designers often ask for book recommendations. My first answer is, have you made stuff? You probably already, already read enough blog articles and watch EDC talks, so go make stuff. It doesn't always have to be finished games to test out ideas in Engine. Uh, then it will be helpful to read some stuff after you've made or while you're making stuff. Here are a few books. People go look at GDC YouTube videos as well for tons of great talks. Uh, yeah, the only, the only talks... But the important thing overall is to alternate between the practice craft and making stuff and absorbing some new perspectives and best practices. By engine, I mean like whatever, twine, frostbite, modding, cardboard bits, who cares, make stuff. And uh, absorbing new perspectives and best practices. So already this number one is huge. It's pretty much too big for a number one. But essentially, um, I don't know. A lot of times when people talk about a good place to start, they're generally isn't a really good place to start with a, a field this broad. You, you can start by reading stuff, you can start by playing stuff, you can start by making stuff, you can start by talking about stuff. It doesn't really matter. I don't really care about the sequence. The most important thing is you gotta do enough of it. So, uh, so I have these elements here broken down, just listing them out one by one. 
Um, but kind of my overall advice to somebody who only has a few minutes to watch this video is you already know how to be a great designer. You just don't want it enough, right? Uh, some of my new theories about learning and how people uh, operate in this world and how they grow and you know do tasks and fulfill roles is you already know how to do stuff well or at least a little better than you currently do you just don't do it because for whatever reason you're afraid you're lazy you just don't want it enough right so like I don't know why people I've never been that kind of person so I can't really relate to this anything anything that I've wanted to do in life I just start right uh, I, you know, started playing violin. I started playing piano. I wanted to do harmonica for a little bit, so I got a harmonica and started practicing from the book. Uh, every single thing I wanted to do, most likely there's some first step to do that's relatively cheap, relatively in reach, and really gets your feet wet for doing it uh, and seeing if you really want to move forward with it. So games are no different. <laughs> when I was in second grade, we had a bug unit and I got the stone fly and I, and we were all supposed to make a board game in or about our bug. And I created like a board game about the entire sort of larva to pupa, pupa stage to full stone fly and the entire sort of ecosystem. I thought that was so fun uh, designing that. Obviously I like game design, but it started from a really young age. And I remember being on car trips with a deck of cards with my brother and we wanted to make a strategy game. So we started making up rules and doing stuff and playing on the playground. We'd make up our own rules. We'd have Foursquare and then we'd add rules to it. So like in general, I think a lot of people have a lot of experience making games. That's why I kind of said before, games have level editors, but even just picking the right attributes for a stage in Smash Brothers, that's a kind of a game design oriented mindset, right? Like what kind of fun do I want to have? Who am I playing with? What are their skills? What could be really hilarious? What could allow everyone a chance to win? Like all these things you're juggling and you're just in the menu. So again, I think you, for game designers, you probably already started and there is not necessarily a good starting place. So just kind of, I guess, initially reflect on all the things that you've done. That'd probably be a good way to start. But yeah, uh, GC talks are a good way to go. Do not watch YouTube critics unless they're me. That's all I can pretty much recommend. Almost all of them are too shallow. And if you're finding like a lot of good nuggets from them, then you are not exposing yourself to enough uh, sources because a single blog article of mine or a single GDC talk or a single like something, a book, a single chapter in a book will give you far more information, far more structure uh, on how to improve as a game designer and talking about games than you'll get from these YouTube videos. They're mostly doing it for entertainment they're mostly doing it for a living right or trying to make money or whatever so that's a completely different thing that than we're interested in so stay away from most youtube videos um yeah alternating between the practice and the craft and making stuff and absorbing new perspectives and best practices this is such a such a huge sort of ask right here um yeah but i've I said before in a lot of my learning theories that uh like i've expressed before the five stages of uh, learning. Actually, I should pull that up because I can explain that really well. Uh, here we go. And these, this is like a, a pattern of learning that I've seen exhibited in every single field with every single type of person in every single possible capacity, at least like all the people that I've directly interacted with and stuff like that. Uh, so, oop, not that. I'm going to read the, I'm going to type in five stages. Okay, so this was a design doc that I, uh, this is a design doc that I made for my game Enlighten, and Enlighten is a game all about learning, so I've been thinking about these kinds of things and observing things and doing experiments in this area for quite a long time. Uh, the five stages of learning are distinct behavior and attitude stages that are most prominent when a person is attempting to self-teach. Uh, because the self-taught learner is their own teacher and student simultaneously, the added stress, lack of knowledge, and shifting experience level tends to create these behaviors. So I think this is pretty much inevitable when you are self self learning. It would be neat to have players slide a slider uh, to where they think they are on the spectrum before playing. That's just an idea I have for the game. Uh, so the stages are one most receptive. The learner is curious at the moment of inspiration. A learner is receptive to receive uh, direction. Let's see if that's, uh, I'm gonna do this centered on the screen. And I'm going to zoom in even more, can't do that. Uh, 
the learner is receptive to receive direction and instruction from just about anywhere. They'll go to books, movies, websites, TV. Uh, quit, quit messing up. Quit messing up. Uh, TV, random strangers for advice. They'll go to anywhere. Okay, you're still messing up. Stop that. And they are a sponge and typically absorb more information than they can effectively use or deal with at their early stage of learning. So this is like um, one of the most short-lived but most impressionable stages for someone who is attempting to, you know, embark in a new hobby, a new field, or a new path. Uh, then it quickly becomes, people start becoming selective of sources. This is uh, stage number two where the learner begins to question the source of the advice, instruction, and information. Without any real experience or knowledge to accurately judge the quality of these sources, the learner tries to filter out which sources will be effective for him or her. This behavior is probably the result of the learner feeling the limitations of their time and energy, and once the learner gets a sense of how long their journey will be, they will begin defensively and foolishly pruning sources by quality, perceived quality. Uh, this happens all the time. It's so weird. People ask questions about games and game design and you offer some kind of information or point to a video or whatever. Like, well, what games did that person make? What does this person know? I'm, like, is this person famous? I never heard of them. And you're like, yeah, sometimes that's a, a nice handy pre-filter for trying to identify things of quality. But if somebody directly tells you and points you to a source that's a direct answer to your question, it's probably a good idea not to question them like right off the bat, you really don't know anything when you're in those early stages, especially. But then stage number three is rejective. Having attempted to learn much on their own, the learner must carry the extra stress, I'll highlight it, extra stress and burden of guiding their own learning process and learning from it. This extra stress leaves little room outside advice, which feels more like interruptions or distractions. So the person, they really aren't being taught by anyone and they're really rejecting a lot of things but sometimes a little bit of advice gets in and it really just feels disruptive like I'm already in the middle of doing something I can't handle doing anything else well that's because the added stress of being a teacher and a learner and this particular sort of situation that the person put themselves in uh, blinding blindly using trial and error requires keeping track of many details and testing many hypotheses hypotheses uh, which is exhaustive work. So these people shut themselves off a lot of the times, uh, even when you're trying to help them. Then stage four, selective of tips. With less mental stress than the previous stage, the learner is able to receive a small degree of advice or instruction. Having attempted to learn on one's own, the learner was, has likely run into many hurdles, roadblocks, or problems. At this stage, the learner is looking for advice to move forward with their learning, but because their mind is still greatly burdened and they are more focused on keeping track of their own likely inefficient progress with their trial and error experimentation, the learner is only willing to accept tips rather than the larger, more comprehensive instruction. The learner will only partially listen for instructions, filtering for like that one tip that will push them over the edge to success, but there oftentimes isn't that one tip. Uh, that's just how it goes. So a lot of times people will ask online about games, uh, what their game is doing wrong, right? Like, oh, what, what's this game doing wrong? Like, what's, what's something I can fix? A lot of times the problems of the game are baked in so deep that requires such a long conversation, such a uh, an ana uh, level of analyzation or a deconstructive look at things, a reverse engineering, that like they don't want to stick around for that conversation. Or every time you suggest like stepping back and gutting like a, a system they made a long time ago or something some, somewhat fundamental, they're just like, ah, I can't change that, it's too late. Well, that's kind of like the same thing happening here. They just want to know one thing that will quote unquote make their game deep or, or fix it or whatever. I and mean, it's just so much more complicated than that. Um, in the other talk that I did, which I made a YouTube video of, one of the ending comments I made was, when you start a game project, the quality of that game is fixed. And even though that, quality, that game may last for a very long time, and you may try to study in the middle of that process, you really can't get past that initial sort of fixed quality level uh, that you started with. It's really because you're building games and systems on top of other systems, and if they have limitations, those limitations are going to be there from the core. And changing surface level things is really not going to address that core, and uh, there's really not a lot you can do about that. You're supposed to finish the project and move on, and then take your lessons, and then learn and improve. So the final stage is dejected, maybe re-resorptive, re resorptive or reabsorbing. 
After the learner has failed to teach themselves a task which is hard, even in a structured learning environment, the learner is open to fully receive instruction and advice. After all the learner reasons, they tried everything else and couldn't figure it out. Though the learner is open in this stage to instruction, the teacher then has the burden of sifting through the learner's complex, varied, and likely inefficient experiential knowledge. This effort for the teacher is at least double the work and at this stage the learner may lack confidence, right? So you may be in one of these levels, I don't know. Uh, sometimes people are like, I don't understand any of the fun, somebody just tell me. And it can be like that with competitive games too and competing in esports. You're like, I haven't won a single match. What am I doing wrong? Someone just tell me what to do. Like, I'll listen to everything you say. I'll do everything. A lot of times people don't stay too long in this dejected uh, period because they either give up completely thinking that, oh, it's just not for me or I'm not good at X and they kind of internalize that failure or they just, um, they don't know, have any source to turn to to sort of like uh, help them. So that happens all the time. Ah, so I said all that because you're going to be in one of these five stages if you're self-teaching and you need to realize that the limitations of self-teaching are so, they're so apparent, right? There's only so much you can know before you know it. And if you really have no idea which sort of method or practice that you need to point yourself to to improve, then you really need to listen to somebody. And I'm trying to give you all the advice I can in this short video, which is probably not going to be short. We're going to keep moving. Uh, absorbing some new best practices and best uh, perspectives like this is a huge thing but I guess we'll get to that later um, so yeah make stuff and move on number two oh, that's why I said that so here when I say you already know how to be a great designer and you, you just don't want it enough that's kind of what I'm talking about like there's a lot of simple things you can do that you have to do every day right people tell you you got to do something every day well there's a lot of things you know you could do you just don't do it and uh i guess they're all going to appear in this list but i feel like you already know the answer to your own question every time you feel like you're leaning on your own understanding every time you feel like you don't have a good answer so you're just going to pick one that's probably a mistake that's just how it works <laughs> like most of the things you can do in this world are inefficient or mistakes that's just how it works <laughs> so tanya says do finish stuff even if it's not commercial, make it, complete it, and be done with it. And don't have these projects that you're just sitting on for years and years and years. Don't do that. Just end it. <laughs> um, it's easier to end things when it's like a card game, a board game. Uh, when I was in uh, my sophomore year in high school, we made a card game. And uh, I talked about it before, but we took pictures of all of our classmates. We modeled a card game around high school life. And we printed them out and we played it and I kept the decks and we played it multiple times and we ended that project. There is no lingering regrets or anything. Um, yeah, finishing lots of projects. I finished a lot of my early game projects that I was working on in Game Maker. I had a vision, I set a time, I did it, I finished it. Uh, Neo RPG, which you can see on my blog, is a project that I finished um, in the two to three weekend period of Christmas break in the year 2007 to 2008. Uh, finish it. Blog archives. Neo. RPG. Zoom in. There we go. Uh, yeah, this little black and white game. I taught myself pretty much programming. This is one of the most complex things I just did on my own, and I just wanted to do it so badly. Uh, and I had a lot of drive to do that, but we'll get to that in a second. So finish things. Aspiring designers, this is number three. I usually play a lot of games. The basic questions to ask are, what am I feeling? How do different elements affect the experience? And what kind of changes to those elements? How would the experience change if I change something? This is something you should be doing every day with everything in life. I don't know why you wouldn't be doing this, seriously. This has less to do with being a designer. I think more to just being a person. If you think, if you value your own opinion, if you think you're complex, if you think the world is complex and understanding it is difficult, you need to have a detail-oriented approach to understanding the world. You don't just gloss over everything and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the trees are the same. Everything's the same. All the animals are like four-legged creatures are all the same. Like, no, every animal, every tree, every situation, every example, they're different. And the more you can understand those differences, the more rich and complex the world gets. And in turn, you know, you can better understand yourself. So if you're not playing games and you want to be a designer, I don't know what the heck. I don't know what the heck you're doing. I'll give you an excuse, though. If you're making a game, you don't have to be playing that many games. It's really hard to play and make games at the same time. Uh, 
So don't worry too much about that. Obviously, you're going to be bouncing back and forth. But, um, yeah, you should be playing lots of games lots of times and uh, asking yourself these questions with every movie you watch, every podcast you listen to, every commercial you see, every picture that you watch and think is interesting. You need to be just engaging with the complexity of art and life a lot more. If you're just starting to ask, you, ask yourself these questions with games, you have a lot more work to do and you need to be doing it constantly, constantly. Um, honestly, if you're not asking yourself, what are you feeling? I don't know. And if you, if you, and I feel like a lot of people do this naturally. They just don't do it enough or, or take it far enough. Like, oh, that was scary. I didn't know he was hiding in the closet. That's already doing this. You felt scared. You didn't know he was hiding in the closet. So you know that some element of the unknown and the surprise jump scare got your attention. And you know, it's easy to understand, like, oh, if that scene were, like, in super slow motion, it wouldn't be scary because that defeats the purpose of a jump scare. Like, super simple, right? Uh, you should be doing this all the time. And one of the reasons why I brought up the five stages of learning is that because of those stages, you're going to be like a pendulum bouncing back and forth between learning stuff getting really excited and trying to apply it learning stuff and getting excited and trying to apply it and i think this happens all the time and i think we intuitively know that trying to apply it is a better way to uh learn the material for good better way to memorize it and understand it so we will naturally get a little antsy because we're like okay there's too many things you told me i just kind of want to try it already i want to see it happening i want to see it working and i want to go back and forth with that sort of um positive feedback loop where you learn something and it, you do something and it helps then you learn something and that helps and it do something and that helps so you're going to be bouncing back and forth naturally as a learner anyway if you're not i'm not sure what you're doing it can be useful to reverse engineer some systems or features and understand their design uh yeah <laughs> this is design understanding what it does <laughs> this is what you should be doing not just like because it's useful because it's the job uh, lose your disdain for genres you don't naturally play or enjoy. Ideally, you go play them and understand them deeply to grow, but at least understand it's your personal taste and not the gold standard or whatever it is. This is just this is this advice is kind of referring to and and point to a lot of issues that are complex and bigger than game design. This is kind of pointing at the video game discourse and pointing out that like people you think one game or one game series is the best and everything else should measure up and there are standards to design and everyone should do those things or else they're behind the times and treating design like technology where we're supposed to be building on um, past things and just kind of gluing stuff on top and making things better and better. Yeah, you, should have, you shouldn't be in that sort of attitude anyway. And the more games you play, the 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 more, the, the, the less strongly you'll feel this anyway. Um, it's your personal taste like sometimes people make a weird separation of like there's things you think and know and then there's your personal taste well if you looked at our old uh, design oriented video which is on youtube it's called define it d-e hyphen f-i-n-e hyphen i-t for definite but you're also defining it um i talked about what taste what a really good definition of taste is and you know it's your ability to Ex uh, explain the meaning of and and sort of explain increasingly complex situations based on your ever widening experience base right so the more games you play the more you can be like oh this is like that and that was like this but one game tried this and messed it up but one game didn't do that and in general most people like this but it didn't do that like the more games you can play and the more games you remember, the better you can contextualize anything. You'd be like, yeah, that control issue is kind of a big deal, but some players found a technique that gets around it, and in a patch later they fixed it, so blah, blah, blah. And you can just sort of understand the full history of it. And a lot of times just being able to explain the context and the history, you know, is what is meaningful and important to understand about in the first place. You don't really need opinions. Recognizing your feelings and exploring them and investigating them, all good things. But in general, you don't need to be like, and it sucks at the end of everything. Like, who cares? Just understand it, listen, and try to remember those details to help you contextualize everything else. So, yeah, I do recommend playing genres you don't naturally enjoy. 
Uh, I've been recommending this forever. This is my spreadsheet that you already know because I talk about it all the time. I keep track of this myself and it's organized by genre and I even have this genre pie chart and it shows all the genres that I played of the 1,200 games that I've played. Most of this, this is a really broad category so that's why it's really big and puzzle. I like puzzle games but I play a ton of different games. And whenever one of these categories is lacking or I haven't played one recently, I go out of my way to play those things. I'm doing that right now. I played Foodie on stream, and I played Cadence of Hyrule, and I dabbled with Joy Lancer, and I beat Gato Roboto for a Metroidvania. I'm playing Titanfall to update myself on horde modes and shooters. I played Plants vs. Zombie to update myself on horde modes and alternative style shooters that aren't just humans and military stuff. Uh, so on and so forth. Like I play a lot of these just to expand and catch up and kind of understand what's going on. And, and a lot of times games are so short, you can just invest a little bit of time into it anyway. And it's it really doesn't take that long to play games. It takes a long time to make games, but it doesn't take that much time to play them. So you should be playing games, and you should be uh, keeping a record of it. We'll get to that later. Uh, exploring unfun genres. Yeah, you need to understand everything that you can about everything that you can. There is no like limit to that. Everything you like, everything you dislike. Getting your feet wet in unfamiliar territory can be helpful in widening your vocabulary. Maybe your experience base, but this will not help you widen your vocabulary. You need to actually focus on vocabulary if you want to widen your vocabulary. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> Bored by combat, but there's a lot of careful content and systems craftsmen in there to learn. Uh, don't love heavy UI, puzzles, platformers, fine. You don't have to make them. You can learn from them. And I feel like I feel like a lot of people think they have opinions and they have taste, right? But then it's really just they weren't brave enough and organized enough to branch out and try different things. Like, there are so many games in every genre. There's got to be some kind of like example out there or a mix or whatever that you can stomach that you can play a little bit. And enjoying things a little bit, there's something wrong with that. We watch a lot of movies we enjoy a little bit. We just saw Godzilla. Really great visuals, but the story, not so good. I enjoyed it. I don't have to love the movie and I don't have to like do this like, oh no, but I, I like the visuals with the story. Like just move on. Like it's not that big of a deal. So... I feel like the more you understand things and the more you can express yourself, whether it's a good movie or a bad movie, a good game or a bad game, a good experience or a bad experience, that, again, takes off a lot of pressure off you feeling like you need your opinions and you're, and you're like, this game sucks or this game's great to kind of like be the final word. You can just explain it and then be done with it. It's very cathartic. Um, so the more that you understand about games, I think that makes them easier to enjoy. People who didn't understand fighting games like, what is this? Ah, I'm mashing the buttons and nothing good's happening. You're like, you're actually not playing it right at all. So slow down. Let's go over these simple examples and then try to play around it. And then if they actually understand how the game works, they're going to probably have a much better time and a much deeper understanding of the game than just thinking that fighting games aren't for them. You know, like learning is hard and sometimes you're just off the right track. It happens. So I... Likewise, I'm talking about there's a ton of genres that I play. Uh, there's a few that I like almost never touch, like realistic racing games, but that's why I played uh, Burnout Paradise right here. And I like that game a lot. It's really cool. Uh, I don't really do MMOs, but I occasionally do RPGs. I started playing Undertale. You Undertale. Um, yeah. Action RPGs. I played a lot of mobile games because I'm like, everything on the mobile can't be trash. And some of these games we could barely play enough of, right? 0.2 hours for Dragalia Loss. But learned a lot, especially about their you know initial onboarding experience and how that may or may not um, be smooth enough for players who are completely unfamiliar to the genre. Never stop learning. Uh, even if you do something for a little bit, you can get a lot of good experience, but otherwise you need to be playing a lot of stuff. And the only way you can really understand and keep track of, uh, the only way you can really keep track of games you don't play a lot of is by writing them down. I don't know how else you're going to do it. I don't know if you're just kidding yourself and you just think you have a great memory. You don't. <laughs> so write stuff down. 
Uh, speaking of stomping grounds, get a hobby or two outside of making and playing games and commit to them. Cooking, travel, wood carving, music, film, whatever. Designers are problem solvers. You can only be so good at problem solving if your reference points are all insular. Advice I've been giving forever. And uh, I... I'm getting more and more sophisticated theories on how to why do um, why this is the case that just playing games um, will not help you be a good designer. You gotta broaden your experience base and do a lot more work than that. Uh, so this is just echoing stuff I've been saying forever. Um, if you don't have a hobby, uh, what what have you been doing if you don't have a hobby, right? Like it's kind of like the thing I was saying with asking yourself, what do you feel and and what about the thing made you feel that way? You should be doing that all the time. And if you've gotten this far in life and you don't have any other hobby that you think is interesting, you don't play any instruments, you don't do any like sports casually or whatever, you don't draw, you don't do anything. Are you just watching TV? <laughs> are you just playing games? You know that's not enough. You like you know there's more to life out there. And I don't know if you've convinced yourself like I don't have time, I don't have money. You don't need a lot of money to draw. You can draw on like receipts that you get from at stores. And if you just spent like a few minutes drawing on those every time you bought something, you'd have a lot more experience than you do now. It's really just excuse making. And if all if not enough things interest you outside of games, then you're not going to make interesting games. It's highly unlikely. I don't know how you can't think that the world and all of its complexity that games that inspire games and the games creator isn't interesting, at least in the way that it inspired them. Right? Like, you got to do some more stuff and push yourself a little harder if you don't have hobbies. Uh, wood carving will wood carving give you a solution that um, progression problem on level three? Nope, but your brain will be better at lateral and cross system thinking when it has more experiences to draw from. Sure. Uh, get in the habit of writing down your game design concepts before you implement them, but avoid the temptation to write the nitty-gritty feature implementation details. Focus on the player experience, the intended emotional journey. Refer to this often when making. So a lot of people, I think, are not doing themselves a favor by separating the emotional part from the whatever whatever you contrast that with detailed um, design part, like I don't systemic part, code part. I don't know what you're contrasting that with, but it doesn't really matter. I don't make those weird dichotomies like that. Um, so advising someone to avoid the nitty gritty feature implementation details, I say don't avoid it. Write as much as you can, as efficiently as possible, and then that all probably helps you, right? If you could sit there and think about your UI and like describe it or draw it to the T, like exactly to the pixel, how you want it to be in your game, then do it. That means you have an eye for those details, and that definitely means that by writing it down, you can kind of free your brain up to think about other stuff. I don't discourage people from writing down anything. It doesn't take a lot of time to write stuff down that you think. And if you learn how to write while thinking, like on a keyboard, and you're like thinking and writing, it pretty much takes no time. But yes, you should write down your game design concepts. Uh, you should write down all your game design questions. You should write down every single thing you think about games. You see me writing down every single thing about what I played and how long I played it. Hey, we got Kaim in the chat. Uh, yeah, like write down every single thing. Some people are like, why'd you do this? And I'm like, if you're asking me why I do this, then you're probably not going to be a good designer. Like, again, if you're not doing everything you can, then games may, making games and playing games probably doesn't interest you that much. I cannot stop making spreadsheets about games. I cannot stop writing about games. I have this entire notebook. I mean, I've showed this on stream before, but four gigantic spiral notebooks, all with all my thoughts and experiences on games. And then I have an entire blog, which let me go get it, because you asked. Broke the fourth wall. Yeah, so like ugh, my entire blog, 
printed out is this big. It's bigger than the notebooks and it's printed, so it's a lot more organized. I cannot stop uh, writing about games. I cannot stop talking about games, because I really like game design, among many other things that I can't stop talking about. So it never crossed my mind, why would I do this? <laughs> like, I just don't understand the kind of person who doesn't think that the thing they think is most interesting, they wouldn't want to engage with it as many different ways as possible. And, then we're, and if you are like, in tune with how bad your memory is, writing things down, one, helps your memory, and two, you don't have to remember it. I don't know why you wouldn't be doing this. I don't know why you wouldn't be writing stuff down. I have game design ideas that I've been keeping track of since 2003. 16 years, notebooks and notebooks and diagrams and pictures and, and memories and videos or, or sketches, like every single thing. And I've gone back over them and it's really interesting to see like how I've changed um, what kind of things stay the same, but ultimately like this is a list of design issues that I, I have with games Like every time something irks me I started this spreadsheet About a year ago half a year ago, and I was like, you know what? I should just keep a list of all the things that irk me So if I ever make a game I can like be like, you know what? How do I want my enemies to be what annoys me about this this uh, action element and uh, Feedback element in action games and like I could just review it and I could tell someone else about it And we could talk about it and we can brainstorm it and that's far better than just keeping everything in your head and not talking about anything and never getting the words. So stop making excuses and just start writing stuff down. I don't have the language, you know English or you know whatever language you know, just do it. It improves over time and you can always ask me for help. That's why I created Design Oriented. There's really no excuse if you're watching this video because nobody watches these videos anyway. <laughs> but yeah, the DO topic will, all these color coded topics that I use all the time just slowly, naturally created it because I was thinking about aspects of games and I needed more and more precise language to do so. Here's a list of design awards I give about games that do things great, maybe the best of their type. So then I mark their type, whatever topic will it is, and then I have a whole list over 100 things of things I think games, examples that excel in doing X, Y, or Z, like a, sh a game with shared health, um, games that do periscope viewfinder type controls, uh, stuff like that, right? I have a whole, this, uh, I transferred all the ideas from my old notebook into the spreadsheet. Oop. Thanks for telling me. Boop. I transferred all the ideas from my old notebook. This green spiral is this green one here that I showed you. I'm not gonna get it back out, but they all have different colors. And I just transferred the uh, ideas that I wrote down into just a simple, spreadsheet with all the categories over the years over a hundred and over 200 ideas right it's just things i think of i have like an idea a day nowadays and i just write them down you can read them this is all public uh i started this new one which is game specific critique instead of writing articles about games i'm just gonna write down specific notes about specific aspects and just move on uh you know if you want to know my opinions and stuff I have everything ranked by series. If your series has more than three three or more games, I put you on the list, ranked by genre, and other random graphs. <laughs> but yeah, never stop. Google really makes it easy to keep track of this stuff over time. I've played over 16,000 hours of games. That's just from the records that I could actually sort of account for. There's many games in my childhood I have no record for, as you can see, if I scroll up the hours column hours played has like holes in it everywhere. I've beaten 56% of the games I've played. So that means whether I like them or don't like them or whatever, put in the time to do that. I've 100%ed uh, 106 different games, right? And it only counts if it's 100%. Why is this a 91? I did not play that. What the? That should not be there. What was that supposed to go to? Nope. Games. So let's get back to the questions. Um, get in the habit of writing down everything I say. Everything. Uh, you might enjoy writing endlessly detailed lists about of content or spreadsheets of systems, items, idea. That's fun, but it's also a trap because it's the cart before the horse. The player experience needs to direct what kind of uh, this player experience thing. That's just such a dumb distinction between the design you're thinking about and this quote-unquote player experience. It's all the player experience. You are never not experiencing this stuff. 
And to understand design means whether or not it's the first thing that players see, like a character on the screen, or the thing that they never thought about, like ghost jumping or the tiny little like uh, fine-tuning mechanical feedback elements that you're gonna put into your game. Doesn't matter if they consciously think about it or not, it's all a part of what makes your experience good. So like, that's it. It's like trying to tell someone like, oh, don't think about the grammar in your sentences. Like, well, the grammar is also indicative of the sentence structure, which is indicative of the exact thoughts and the way I think them. And I'm not going to really separate the two because a comma in the right place can give the reader all the information they need to properly space out these concepts. Like, I don't know why you would make a distinction from that. I, don't, I think this started happening when a lot of people are like, oh, I play games for the, uh, uh, shoot, I'm bad at games and I don't know a lot. Uh, the experience, yeah, I'm all about the emotion and the, uh, what, what's game like? Uh, story, yeah, that's what I'm about. We all like stories and we all like feeling things. So making a distinction between like the gamer who's pumping his fist because he, he did this like and, and won the challenge because it was a gameplay challenge or the gamer she over here just likes the story. It's all what games are doing or can do or trying to do, and it's all in one big bucket. I really feel, see no need to, to, to separate these conceptually. Uh, concept of player experience document, blah, 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 blah. And you know the, the other weird thing about focusing too much on the player experience? If you sit there and you really listen to what people actually say, and then you look at the games that they're talking about, you can find individual design elements that are the reason why they feel that way. And I don't know how, at what point you would think like, yeah, this game doesn't have ghost jumping, but the player experience is about this emotional thing and the fact that they were missing a whole bunch of jumps and getting frustrated, the fact that they're complaining about the game over system has nothing to do with their ability to jump off of things in this game about jumping. Of course it does. Because if you fix that, they're probably gonna be better at jumping. If they're better at jumping, they're probably gonna focus on the other elements. If they focus on the other elements, they're probably going to have an easier time advancing instead of like, I thought I made that jump and now I lost my lives and it's game over. Like all those things are connected. There's just no separation. But, yes, yes, I told you to reverse engineer a game that you should help you understand how a player experience is achieved, not how to make a game. Be basing your game design solely on someone else's work or accepting a genre label before defining those player experience goals. For example, if you want to make a 2D game that's exploring teaching the player timing skills mastery, it's possible you will independently reinvent Mario Brothers, but it's also possible you will invent something new and fresh. Whereas if you start saying, I'm making a platformer, therefore the camera must do this and the character must jump like this, that's probably all you can make. Be aware of inheriting other game design problems and solutions without even knowing what they were trying to achieve. So it's true that you should understand games deeply, and in doing so, that means you need to understand what the game was going for, the kinds of things that worked well for that, the kind of things that didn't, and in general, the context of the games around that time and what games have done since. That's a lot of work, no joke. But everyone does it anyway when they say this platform is the best since whatever. You're doing all that work anyway. Um, so yes, you need to understand the context uh, that games create. But this whole idea that thinking about making a platformer somehow puts you in a box that you can't escape from is total BS. That makes no sense, right? Like if you have all this design detail backing you up, it doesn't, like I said before, it doesn't matter where you start in your design process. Uh, be trying to improve yourself as a game designer and it also doesn't really matter where you start trying to make a game You can start at the last feeling ending scene move Controller input whatever you can start at the beginning like JK Rowling had the ending of Harry Potter in mind when she wrote the beginning which means you know that just bodes well and reflects on in my mind, I think of like, that's a real writer who can see the end when they write the beginning because stories are all about that sort of arc that you shape and the journey that you can describe from point A all the way to the ending of the story. And if you have the ending in mind, you can so much better pick the details that are gonna be important and relevant as you move along instead of just making up stuff. So while that's great for writers, uh, you could do it in any non-linear kind of way when making games. You can start in the middle, you can start in the end, but getting that context for what your game experience is like on a big scale and also you know, on a small scale is just the everyday exercise and thoughts of a designer. So likewise, when you're talking about making a game, you can start with, I'm making a platformer. You can start with, 
Uh, I'm going to make a spoof off of another game. You can start anywhere. If you actually can design, it doesn't matter where you start. You are going to use your understanding, your experience, your taste, your process to get to where it needs to be or where you can take it. I've heard other people say that. I think Keith Bergen said it like, oh, just thinking about the genre puts you in a box. One, if you actually played a bunch of games like this, you'd actually understand that there's a ton of diversity with even a single genre. Two, if you played a bunch of different genres, you'd understand that there's a lot of blending between genres. Action RPGs, like like the Dragalia Lost as an action RPG is very different from Darksiders as an action RPG, and it's very different from every else that's an action RPG like it's very different from Yokai Watch they have a lot of things in common they may have similar inspirations or like game roots as far as uh, as far as we can tell but they're so different I just the only thing that's gonna paint you or put you in a box is yourself because you didn't do enough of the legwork we talked about earlier in this in this video that's it don't even worry about it uh, as a middling experienced designer reading readings and talks will stop being actively helpful and be best used as occasional reference material you may f feel like you're floundering in a guess and check general blanket design statements can only take you so far experienced designers sometimes form retreats or think tanks and play f pay for the privilege each game is its own problem to solve if you're physically isolated join and create some online communities like design oriented where we only talk about game design and we make videos about game design and we play each other's games and we critique each other's stuff and i don't know any other community like it and if you're not in a community like this you are not trying hard enough if you're watching this video and not in this kind of community then you really don't want to be a designer because it's all free and it doesn't even hurt to click the discord thing or follow twitter i don't really tweet um from design oriented that much anyway doesn't matter if you're physically isolated, join some online stuff. So, I already talked that YouTube videos are really not helpful unless they're from GDC or me. And, but this whole thing like reading stops being helpful, like depends on what you're reading. I still recommend my blog to every single person who wants to be a designer. It's all these books and there's a lot there that go into super detail about so many things. There's no way that you are more advanced than the stuff written in this. I can tell you that. <laughs> like, you may have a lot of specific experience about a genre or a game or a series or a production pipeline, sure. But this stuff covers so much about design. It's insane. And, like, no, oh, like two people, maybe three people have read it all or said they read it all, right? So you're going to be in a small club, exclusive club, if you do anything close to that, right? And it just gets more... So, like, the way I write... I write my learning process into the article. So I tell you, like, I was doing this and I was inspired. Then I want to know about this. So I looked it up. I think this is the best definition. Let's go with it. If I need to tweak it later, I'll tell you I tweaked it later. Uh, let's apply it to a game. Let's apply it to a bunch of games. And you can just see me learning step by step. And then if you engage with it, you know, find your own gaming examples, uh, write down your own stuff, you'll be also just walking right in line with the, how I got to this point as a designer. Like, it's all there. So there's plenty of stuff like this uh, at my blog. There's a couple other websites out there that could probably also have some good material. I don't, I just don't, it just always depends on where you go for the information you're looking for. Honestly, like if you're making a um, fighting game and you don't have that much experience in fighting games, you need to be reading some of the few articles out there that really dedicated fighting game players write and how they talk to their own community. You got to read it. And just because there's not a lot out there, that should be the case, right? Like most things out there suck. A lot of things out there are all right, but there's a very, very few things that are great. That just makes sense. And that's what I expect. Um, but the fact that people make think tanks and stuff. Yeah, I've heard about a few of these. Um, you got to always have friends. You got to always have somebody who can get you honest and good critique. And uh, you got to work at that, right? So if you don't have a community, this is one design oriented. Otherwise, don't make any excuses. Experienced designers sometimes retreats that, yeah. Number eight, get comfortable with criticism. Don't put up with harassment, but do grow thick skin. You can't grow as a designer, designer if you can't listen to players, even if it's unpleasant. This is so hard. Taking criticism is always so hard. It's so funny. But I've, like, if you're constantly immersed in this kind of environment, it, I think it takes the bite off of it a little bit, or at least you can like bounce back a lot faster because maybe it never stops hurting. <laughs> you're never not going to be vulnerable, right? But you got to do it. Um, 
you need you need to find somebody that will give you good analysis and criticism and most people can't do it most people don't understand games themselves most people don't have a language to talk about games in a detailed and design oriented way and therefore most people won't be able to give you good feedback because they lack those things so if there's someone out there or maybe a community wink wink that has people that have really put a lot of energy into finding the language and giving structured analysis you got to take that especially if it's free which it is for everything that's worth because you are not going to find a lot of uh, usefulness out of someone's like yeah it's fun or even if they're like this is the best game ever like it's not really it's not really good enough <laughs> it's really like honestly some of my favorite reviews of hey bleach what's up some of my favorite reviews for critical gaming are my kid Icarus review my pokemon review they're like eight parts ten parts each breaking it down and just explaining why i love it uh, what I understand about it, what I think I would have changed, like all these things, all the way down as deeply as I could go while still making it readable <laughs> uh, for everyone else. Yeah, but you got to do this. I think we can reinvent the way that we do criticism with each other, right? Uh, the, the more language you have and the more experience you have, you're like, oh, I think I could you know, create a form that will allow people to sidestep the, the, the sting of somebody not liking your thing and then just kind of get get along with the um the growing part so if you want to experiment on criticism and analysis feedback methods you should probably come here too because i love thinking about that kind of stuff um just recently on do i played fernando z's game hunter net and i played uh collect sugar magnets by one of our newest members akamarak and i played uh gummy sugar bear clothes natness i forgot what the title was <laughs> uh sorry um hoops dog it but i forgot the title played their games on stream talked about it uh talked with them afterwards gave them a lot of specific feedback and that's it all right i don't know if they're going to get more specific feedback or anyone else out there is going to play their games kind of more than i did but i try to give everyone as much as i can to help them as much as possible so if you're not taking advantage of that i'm just going to shrug um designers can't grow in a vacuum maybe fine artists can but blah blah, blah players co out there blah blah the very fact that you really can't make really complex big games by yourself means you have to be working with someone and when you work with someone you really need to communicate and when you communicate uh, with other people you are really tapping into their broad experience hopefully with your broad experience hopefully and that really is the reason why games are so hard to create but also how you can really um avoid being in a vacuum with games pros and cons to being solo pros and cons to being a big group but if you're doing your job with the earlier numbers and playing a lot of games, and in the other uh, talk that I gave, what did I call it? Uh, oh, foundation of game design. At the end, my simple practical advice was just like, listen to everyone and talk to anyone, right? If somebody, for whatever reason at all, wants to talk to you about games, talk to them about games. And every single other voice on the internet that comes by, passes your path, you should probably just listen to them. You don't have to like, read every single thing they say but listen you don't have to chime in really not necessary especially on twitter just read listen think reflect move on and you'll you'll hit this uh you'll get out of the vacuum by doing that it just should be a natural process of how you're improving as a designer anyway if you can't honestly evaluate and iterate on the player experience somehow your craft will be stunted sure uh, the more experience you gain, the less dependent on play tests you can become. But if you are dreaming of someday ignoring what players experience in your game, you are dreaming about isn't game design. Talking about player experience again. So like one of the early um, sort of hurdles for beginning craftsmen, craftswomen, and craft folk is that as they're learning, they don't have the context and the experience to like really know if they're making a mistake or really know if the method and the approach that they're using is a good or a bad one. So oftentimes they'll go all in on a thing and like, yeah, it may be weird. It may be extreme. It may be sort of counter um, productive according to like the, the, the craft of that medium. But a lot of times when you're learning, that's all you can do. You really don't have the experience to do anything else. So when I read stuff like this and you're like, oh, if you're thinking about ignoring the player experience, well, yeah, some people make games. And like I said, with the learning um, stages, if you're in that middle stage where you're rejecting things or fourth stage where you can barely take advice, then you're pretty much ignoring what the player is doing. You're pretty much ignoring what other people would advise you. And that's fine. 
push through the stages, finish your project. If you still do all the steps that we talked about, finishing your project and doing research, you'll get over those humps. You'll learn a lot. Um, so yes, ignoring things isn't a good way to make great games probably, but you're, you're going to be ignoring things at some point when you're making stuff, either because you're focused on making it and you're not playing games, you're not listening to people because you're still forming the thing and it's still in its elementary stages, or you're so close to the end of the project, you're like, I, I just can't change that, like, whatever. So, like, that's just part of life, right? Part of being a limited learning human. Uh, we're building places for other humans to be, like architecture. Even the most inspired architects' ability to make houses for other humans would be limited if they didn't remind themselves what it feels like to live, breathe. Yeah, but this doesn't matter. Like, some artists just do things just for themselves. They don't publish it. They don't tell you about it. They don't tweet about it. Video games are also an artistic medium slash craft, so you can ignore every single person. You can make the your favorite game of all time and never put it on the internet just play it on your own computer for the rest of your life that is perfectly legitimate i don't really care i don't really think you need to consider other humans humans are annoying anyway <laughs> get comfortable with ambiguity except that you may never know whether or not what you did is the right solution game design is an art and no amount of obsession or process can turn into a pure science yeah it's not a pure science but there's science there there's there's structure there and games are like half real and there's a really interesting fusion of its technical side and its artistic side. Um, I don't know what you were doing in life if you think that there's always the right solution. That just probably means you were never too deep in any field that you were doing anyway. In math, things get pretty crazy. In physics, things get pretty crazy when you're at the highest levels. In art, and in, in the way people understand history, things get pretty crazy and there's ambiguity everywhere. The easiest and most clear examples of things are when you're a beginner, because <laughs> that stuff is the least complex. If you've ever gone deeply into any direction, any hobby, any field, you should already know this. Most senior league game designers I know are extremely high on the openness to the experience in the ocean of personality tests. I think it's why, in addition to hobbies, a lot of our thinking. There used to be no clearly right answer or perfect solution to a design problem. There are common solutions to common problems where you'll find thornier, messier problems and solutions. The more you experiment in your design, you have to accept it on some level. Basically, like, you're not perfect. Sure. I don't know if people are not accepting that. I think we all get that. Um, the, some of the frustrations that we can express while making things can be come out as if, like, it could sound like you think there's a perfect answer. But really, people express their frustrations and disappointments in all kinds of ways. you got to learn how to sort of read through that. Um, multiple times in this advice, Tanya mentioned experimenting and trial and error. I think game design doesn't have a lot of trial and error. I think there's a lot of specific combinations you can try. And if you understand design, there's a lot, like, like she said, you know, you can bypass a lot of that if you just understand design. But, um, a lot of people still think it's just like throwing ideas at a wall and seeing what feels good or what sticks. You can do much better than that. And the only way you can believe me is just looking at other fields of design and craft and knowing how confident they are doing specific things at a high level or just taking my word for it. If you've never experienced it, you could, you have no idea. You have no idea how clear an idea can be uh, for a game, even though it hasn't been put on paper or um, put in code yet. If you feel com confronted, comforted, uh, comforted by the idea of right and wrong answers, design may not ultimately be your most comfortable field. Sure. We need the Kim Jong-gi of game design. <laughs> You're always making fun comments like that. <laughs> uh, know thyself. Most designers tend to naturally instinctively towards either content, characters, level, world, or systems, rules, structures, tools. It's best not to fear or avoid the one that doesn't come easily, but it's also okay to focus on the one that brings you pleasure. This is kind of like, the only thing I'll say about this is when I was in my creative writing workshops in college, <coughs> occasionally the word math was uttered and people would squirm in their seats and freak out. Oh, I hate math. I hate numbers. Ah, math. I was like, what? At the time, I was co-majoring in creative writing and engineering. So like math, English, like I live in both worlds. Uh, and when I go to the math side, people are like, yeah, you got, we got to write a paper writing. Ah, like, ah, we don't want to write anything on paper. Why do we have to write a report? I'm like, come on, guys, it's writing. Look, eh, words. So 
I can I know from personal experience that a lot of people when they commit to a field like that, they are pretty much like this or that. You're more powerful if you can do this and that. Just saying. And if you stop squirming in your seat so much, maybe you get just a little bit a little bit more comfortable with the other side. But yeah. I think the people who specialize in some of these things, like first of all, levels, that's game design. That should go over here. Story can go on the left. World is the same as story, it's just setting. So really there's just story versus everything else about games. I wouldn't even Yeah, it's just a classic story versus gameplay um, dichotomy here. That's fine. I think if you're in the games for a bunch of this story reasons, you probably need a much stronger background in creative writing. You need to understand stories in the craft of fiction a lot better than you do now. It's not just like, oh, I want to throw a bunch of cool details in the open world. Stop. It's not good. It's not fun for me. <laughs> and I don't think... I think you would have a lot more control, understanding, and enjoyment of your craft if you actually learned your craft. Instead of like, I like a lot of video games and I'm doing the story aspect. Learn stories. Uh, lots of people enjoy both and lots of game design it tends to be both, but you don't have to apologize for enjoying spreadsheets. Who would do that? Not me. <laughs> uh, can't help you grow. Okay, so those are like the 10 things. So like you already know how to be a great designer. You just you just don't want it enough. If you every time I say something like you should do this and in your mind you're like I don't do it and then you don't do it, you just don't want it enough. Honestly, like I I don't know what to tell you. Like when I wanted to learn a song on piano, I started practicing it. I found the sheet music and I played it because I wanted to learn it. I didn't talk about how much I wanted to learn it. I didn't say like, "Oh, if I had the time." I made the time. I did the thing. It's work. So if you're not doing as many of these practical things as possible, like you don't have to have a massive spreadsheet. And the fact is, it gets massive over time. You don't worry about it. You don't worry about the, the, how long the list is. You just worry that you just be glad that you wrote something down, right? Honestly. And maybe I should make this spreadsheet and like empty it out and then leave it as a template for other people to use. Because maybe, maybe you need just as much help as you can get moving forward. And if I just like take this as a template, it would help you a lot. If you want, if you want to see something like that, just let me know. I'll put in the time. I'll help you out. But um, yeah, so that was like the long talk, just responding to the things that were said in that Twitter thread. I think practical advice is you can just talk to me, and I can always point you out to articles. You can just talk to me, and I'll point you out to games. I played a lot of games, obviously, a lot, a lot of babies. Um, 1,282 games. But beyond that, if you're just not interested in understanding why, if you're not motivated, if it doesn't like keep you up at night that you couldn't beat a level or something, then, then that l lacking energy, that lacking drive, it's just setting the bar a little bit lower on your maximum quality of the experience that you can convey to somebody else. And most of the time when people make games, nobody who can make games, it's like so rare that they make a game well underneath their uh, skill level. Like, I programmed Enlighten, I did a whole bunch of other things, uh, some action games, but what if my next project was like, I wanna make a single WarioWare micro game. That's it. I know I can make that, no question. But usually when people make games and they put all that effort in, they wanna make an idea that's like, butting up against or maybe beyond their maximum level and they want to grow into it or they want to take their maximum level and see what more they can do and then they kind of learn as they push up that high you know that's like a recipe for decreasing your chances of making a successful project you know it it just makes sense but we do it anyway so like maybe one other thing i want to encourage people to do is when you understand design and you understand yourself and you understand your skills you should like games of a whole wide range of complexity, right? Like simple games and complex games, short games and long games. And you should just like get used to thinking about making short games or long games as your next project. And that'll make it a lot easier to sort of potentially make something well within your skill set instead of crashing and burning like so many do.
Yeah. So my blog, I think because it reflects my learning journey uh, from start to finish, I always recommend it. Uh, and my blog, I also have this uh, Design 101. It covers everything conceptually, starting with the 101. And some of these articles I wrote later, some I wrote earlier. So this is organized by concept. And you, and you read these straight down, right? And then you can talk about this. And then you can talk about this. There's, there's a couple of points where you can jump around to other topics. But really, these increase in complexity. So like you probably should go in order as much as possible. Reading these articles. Yeah, there's a lot of them. You got time. If each one of these articles isn't sparking some kind of curiosity in you, if you're not just like, shoot, I don't want to read the second one because I want to write down this idea I have or play this game or I want to see if what he's saying is true, then do you want it enough? Are you really interested in games? Because there's a lot of stuff I'm saying, and for one reason or another, you should probably want to probe it, <laughs> understand it, and keep reading. I did like all the work developing this language. I got this little glossary here. It's a dictionary. And you can you can download it even though it's like a relatively old version. Or you can just read all the definition work that I either gathered from good sources, refined, or created myself. Like lots and lots of words. It helps you understand when you have words for things and you use language to help your brain out. Just saying, stop making excuses. 450 entries and counting as of 2011. I can't believe it's been so long. <laughs> it's impossible to look up items in the glossary. So if you want to go to the letter, that's why I put these asterisks here. You just type in control F, asterisk G, and it'll take you straight to the G, right? And you can just kind of scroll down. Each section isn't too big. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean. If you type in goal, right, and you want this goal, there's 44 references. This, this, I made this in 2011, and I have not gone back, so I'm not putting any more work into this thing. Um, it has hyperlinks to the articles that discuss it, so that's a lot harder to come by than finding the right uh, word on the page when it's alphabetically arranged. So, like, I don't know, man. I think the, the there's potential that the PDF might have like a glossary maybe or like a clickable hyperlinks. No, did I not do that? It has page numbers. Yeah, that kind of helps. You can still click these uh, links in this article, so that kind of helps. Yeah. Let's go to the dark version. Yay. Yeah, so like, and if, you, if you're not motivated and driven by these like deep questions, and by deep, I mean, it can be as simple as why do I like this thing? Why do I like this thing over this thing? That, should just, that sent me on a spiral of investigative thinking and articles that pretty much created this blog. I started with why, do, why is Mario so good? And I was like, I don't know why it's good. I think I know why. I can start talking about little things, but overall, I can't really put it succinctly. And that's why I started with Mario here. Mario. Mario, or Super Mario Galaxy, yeah, Mario. And then I finally got my legs underneath me and started talking about Mario melodies somewhere up here. Cool. Yeah, so you can be reading, you can be playing a lot more. Uh, stop playing your favorite game. I have to stop playing Splatoon. I played over a thousand hours of it, and I'm like, I'm not learning. <laughs> I'm having fun. I'm not really learning that much. I could be spending this time playing new games and understanding games outside of my, even my comfort zone. So that's what I started doing. Um, you can. Keep track of things on your phone. I use Google a lot. All my spreadsheets, all my documents, uh, design documents and notes and everything, all in one place. Um, yeah. Half the time, I'll say this and end it. Half the time I look at games and there's not a lot of specific advice I can give to people. If you, 
if you see a game that's kind of rough, that either means, one, they didn't know how to program that much and they learned how to program to get it to this point. Um, two, they kind of bit off a little bit more than they can chew, kind of like what I was saying, and they were trying to make a game beyond what they even knew they could program, so like that's kind of hand-in-hand hand with that first one. Or um, they just lacked the experience. I've written pages and pages and pages on why Mario is good, precise, specific detail on why Mario is good, and that is like the high bar of video game quality. If you don't even know what that bar is like, if you're like, yeah, I played Mario before, I never beat it, you need to play Mario, or you need to play something good so you can really very meticulously understand it and then set everything according to that bar, right? Like a lot of modern games, they can be glitchy, they can be buggy, with all their weird patches and weird things that happen. That's not high quality. Stop. Stop treating that as like, this game is so good. Play a game that's so good and then start comparing everything else to it. People talk all the time about games that are outstanding in their genre anyway. Like, oh, Titanfall 2's single player shooter mode campaign is supposed to be really good. I'm going to play it. Somebody said Titanfall 2's horde mode, which is their frontier defense, is really good. I'm playing it now. It's pretty good. Um, yeah. So a lot of times people just need to people just need to go back and study great games. <laughs> and if you if you can't tell the difference between a great platformer and an okay platformer, if you think other platformers are really better than Mario, I mean like other platformers do it differently, but man, there's so many quality things about Mario, it feels like you are completely oblivious to and you need to know what those are. <laughs> Cuz you if you don't even know what they are, you won't make them certainly. And it just kind of spirals down from there. Yeah. So that's that's it for uh, all my advice. All those practical things are good. A lot of times you just need to want it more and do a lot more of it. That's what makes a difference. And never settle for not knowing the answer. Always be curious. And with, if you write down all your questions and you know answer them over time, that's all you really need to know. You'll have all your answers eventually. That's it. And the, the reality is most people don't do this. Most people kind of play a few games, only a few genres, and if they get into game design, they kind of only know that. Uh, and then they kind of trial and error their way through things. I call it winging it. And you can tell. You can tell when... An idea that you know is bad and an idea that you know is the solution because of your experience or you calculated it or whatever. And then other people do this with their hands, like maybe this one, maybe this one. You're like, this one, this one is bad. This makes bad gameplay. This makes the stuff you were complaining about, but you didn't even know it was because of this. Pick this one. If in your mind you're like screaming at yourself, then you have the understanding at least in theory, to contextualize that particular design aspect and understand what it means in so much wider context. But other people just kind of like... <laughs> I think you can tell when a game designer can't do the same thing twice. Yeah. When you have the experience and the, and the framework, you can easily do the same thing. Like You're like this to that, this to that. Oh yeah? Well, draw the face again, okay? Start with a circle, make the chin, you know, eyes halfway down, ears go from the eyes to the whatever, and you're just going through your method, you can draw, when you know how to draw a face, you can draw tons of faces. Oh yeah, well draw a face with somebody with bigger eyes. Okay, well, draw a face, circle, make the chin, your eyes like, you can do it because it's well within your understanding and well within your, your capabilities, your skill. It's not even a question. You're just like, okay, you want me to draw a face? And they're sitting there like, yeah, let's see you draw a face. Like, I can draw a face, it's not that complicated. Draw a face. <laughs> So yeah, you need to be, you need to figure out what kinds of things in games that are that brain dead obvious to you. Like when somebody says it, you think step to step to step to step, alternative to alternative to alternative, game did it like this, 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 and this. It should just be like an explosion in your mind of possibilities. Because that's what it's like in my mind. And I don't question a lot of stuff. And I know how to steer through all these maybes and what ifs and perhaps. You want to play, you want to play a thousand games and see how it affects you? Then play a thousand games. And play them as deeply as you can. Try to beat all of them. Try to 100% all of them. It's not going to happen. But that mindset 
it's the it's the right one to have. Yeah, and I think the root of it comes from not you not thinking enough things are cool. If you don't if you only think a few things are cool and you only play video games and you don't play enough video games too, you won't know what the quality of other things are. You won't know what the quality of high quality video games are. You won't know you won't have like a broad um, possibility space for taking any element of the game and trying things that work and staring around those dangerous waters. Like you just can't. And the, the amount of times I hear the word Dark Souls I'm, it just makes you wonder. It's cool to be inspired by Dark Souls. It's cool. But you gotta have more than that. You gotta have a lot more than that. You gotta know exactly, even if you love Dark Souls, why certain parts are really janky you got to realize that for a character action game the mechanics are not smooth they're not like polished they got all these issues and you go like do i want unpolished jankiness or do i want smoothness and you should be able to go towards the smoothness with your game even if you like dark souls that's not a problem you should have so much more experience and you should be able to talk about it too it's just so hard to talk to people who have not gotten used to articulating their own thoughts and then they have no hope of our understanding your thoughts and kind of meeting you you know midway halfway through because they haven't done the work <sighs> so my last plug for design oriented join us talk to me talk to the people in the chat they know a lot of stuff too we've been doing this for years learning about game design with each other, bouncing ideas off of each other for years and years and years. We even had like a Saturday morning like design school for like half a year where we woke up every Saturday morning, went through articles and talked about stuff. They know their stuff. I know my stuff. And even if it's not all the stuff to know, you at least need to like as quickly as possible gobble that up and move on. There's no excuse. That's it. <laughs> all right, thanks for joining me, guys. I'm going to stop the stream now, right now.